The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, my name is Jillian Schaefer and I'm the Marketing Coordinator for SWK Technologies. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar, 12 Reasons Why HR Software is Worth the Investment, as part of our Managing Your People with Sage Software series, presented by Joe Rotella of Delphia Consulting. A little housekeeping before we get started. Everyone has been placed on mute to keep the background noise down. However, you can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar. To submit a question, look at the question section in your GoToWebinar. We'll answer all questions throughout the presentation as needed and at the end of the presentation. We are recording this presentation and it will be distributed tomorrow to all attendees as well as to those who registered but were not able to attend. Please take a moment during the presentation to answer our three poll questions. With that said, we appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to attend our webinar. We're here to help you get the most out of your software solutions and help you find an easier way to run your business by providing you software and industry knowledge, tools and support whenever you need it. So whether you're here doing research for a new solution or you're just here to learn, we'd like to encourage you to ask any questions throughout the webinar. Lastly, as a quick reminder, SWK is constantly sharing important updates and software tips and tricks on our social media channels. So we encourage you to follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Joe. Thank you, Jolene, and welcome to 12 Reasons Why HR Software is Worth the Investment. I'm just curious, and this will also let me know that you can hear me okay, see the slide deck and everything okay. If you could click the raise your hand icon, the raise your hand if you have HR responsibilities in your organization. So do any of you, Thank you, Michelle. Cool. So then I know at least it's working for Michelle. And then the rest of you are curious about what's going on in that HR space. So that's great. I'm going to go ahead and lower the hands. Let's talk a little bit about why we're here today. I love this quote from Steve Wynn, the CEO of Wynn Resorts Limited. Human resources isn't a thing we do. It's the thing that runs our business. I think the reality is that employees are the foundation of nearly every successful business. And that's why HR is so important. But a lot of times we see that HR gets the least attention when it comes to technology or investment, to be honest. We still have HR folks out there who are doing everything with spreadsheets, Word docs, file folders, checklists. I still even see folks when I go visit them that have those, you know, those open manila folder things that have the two poke metal thing coming out of the top and they do the two hole punch and stick it in there and spread those prongs out. And that's where they're keeping track of everything, kind of like the old medical records. The reality is investing in HR software can really help manage our people through that entire employment life cycle from recruiting all the way through to separation. Today, we'll talk about 12 reasons why an HRMS is worth the investment, how you can generate financial return on investment, and we'll also talk a little bit about other return on investments like cultural and procedural. So let's review what we're going to cover today. I'm going to start with HR Software 101. So we're just going to have a slide or two about the basics. What is HR Software? Then we're going to spend time on those 12 reasons. We're going to talk about how you build a business case, and I'm even going to share with you a template how you write up your business case. We'll talk about how you can manage change. Then I'm going to invite you to some upcoming events we have, and we have contact information for you as well. I want to remind you that if you look in the handouts section of the GoToWebinar control panel, you'll find a PDF of the slide deck that we're using today. So you might want to take a minute and download that. There, It's a great way for you to take notes, either print it out or go green friendly, right? You can click that little kind of looks like a comment post-it note box in Adobe Acrobat and take your notes right in there as well. So let's start with HR software. Really, it's not super complicated to imagine what this is, right? It helps an HR team be more efficient. In many cases, it can automate manual tasks and it keeps all your employee-related information organized. It's great for driving reports and it can in some cases, eliminate the need for paper documents. It also helps employees and managers too, right? With things like time tracking or updating employee directories, maybe handling performance management. The reality is it can make a difference for everyone in the organization. I'd like to start by getting a feel about what HR software you're using today. So I'm gonna launch a quick poll. If you could let me know 
what HR software are you using today? Or maybe you're not even using software, you've got a mix of systems. This will even allow you to check more than one. So that poll should be open now. Let me know what you're using today. So votes are coming in. I'm gonna give folks just a couple more minutes to, minutes, seconds to let me know your selection. Let me know if you're using Office applications like Excel or Word. In many cases, people say, well, our payroll software kind of handles HR as well. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Maybe you're using Sage HRMS today, or maybe you have another HR package. It comes from another publisher. And if you're using a package from another publisher, I'd love to know what it is. The best and really the only way to communicate with me is through that questions box. So you could even type it in as a question, even though it's not a question, and just say, hey, we use this. So it looks like most folks have voted. I'm gonna go ahead and close out this poll in five, four, three, two, one. So based on that poll, about half of you are using applications like Excel and Word, and about half say, hey, you know, my payroll software kind of manages our HR data. So we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through today's webinar. Let's start by talking about the HR software footprint. Of course, the center of it would be the core, the core part of the system. This is really your HR database. This is what's going to store all of your employee data, your demographics, uh, maybe your payroll information, maybe benefit selection, things like that. But then if you look around these tiles that I've got sort of all the way around this strategy at the center, there are different features that HR software might have. And it might have it all in one package, or you might find that, you know, it's it's a best of breed solution where you can pick and choose the modules that are just right for you. I'm gonna just work my way around those tiles and then I've got a list over there on the left in case you print out this PDF. You know, it really starts with recruiting. How do you post jobs and how do people apply for those jobs? What's that whole recruiting experience like? And once you find that ideal candidate, how do you onboard them? How do you hire them and get them into your systems? And then what's it like for them, that very first impression they have of an organization? Of course, we know we have to keep track of people's time and attendance. How's that done? And then how do you pay them? How does that all fit together? How do we manage performance? How do we work on career development? And then of course, comp and benefits. What are the benefits of working for your organization? How do you track all that? And then how do you report on this with people analytics to make better decisions? So typically, HR software can cover all or parts of that footprint. And again, they may do it through different modules that are kind of pieced together. Typically, that's referred to as a best of breed solution, or it might all come in one package. Now, you'll hear different names when we talk about HR software. Right Again, it's really here to monitor, manage and optimize your tasks and the overall HR organ goals of the organization. Typically, we see things referred to as an HRIS, Human Resource Information System. Sometimes they'll call it a Human Resources Management System, HRMS, or even a Human Capital Management Solution. Now, I know some folks really struggle when they hear that word human capital. And I've had folks talk to me and say, hey, you know, you shouldn't say that. It doesn't sound right. Uh, you're treating people there as capital, as a number. Um, we really need to explore the definition a little bit of that. Human capital isn't about a person. It's the combination of people, processes, culture, environment, all of those things, the magic that makes something happen at your organization. So while it's true, as an example, competitors could quote, steal your employees, they really couldn't steal your human capital because they can't get everything, the people, the culture, the processes, the environment, the magic, all of it that comes together. So human capital, although some people think it sounds a bit rough, it's really not about people, it's about all of that magic. We also have ATSs or applicant tracking systems. Some people say solutions. ATS is really recruiting software that helps streamline the hiring process for an organization from beginning to end. It can handle tasks like job postings, even send those to multiple boards, storing the applicant data, even screening application for potential matches. Sometimes we see onboarding software that helps streamline and track the whole process of introducing a new employee to an organization. Sometimes it includes elements like electronic signatures on documents, 
um, maybe tracking their training, giving them employee questionnaires, uh, maybe automating some functions so that it helps um, the behind the scenes of getting somebody on board. Of course, we have performance management solutions, right? And we have employee engagement solutions. And member engagement is not the same as job satisfaction. It's not, do I like my job? It's, do I go the extra mile? Do I, you, you think about it. You may know folks, it may be you in your own environment, where they take that extra step. They're like, oh, I really want to do this because it has my name on it, or I'm passionate about this, or I'm passionate about the people I'm working with. Those are some of the different types of engagement. So HR software typically covers all of these things, again, as separate modules or maybe integrated together. Let's dive in now and start to talk about the 12 reasons why HR software makes sense. This first one is all about improving data management. I like to see your HR system be the single source of truth or the single point of truth for all of your employee data. That really ensures that everyone is making decisions based on the same data. We're all seeing the same thing. That could be demographic information. So, you know, uh, marital status, veteran status, uh, birth date, anniversary date. It's compensation information. What is their rate of pay? How are they paid? Are they full-time, part-time? Benefits and those benefit selections, time and attendance information, maybe in your particular industry, certifications and licensures are important. That can all be tracked in this one place. And I like keeping in one place that single source of truth. And maybe that's because, you know, historically I'm a geek. So one of my degrees is in computer science, and it just makes sense that all employee data is in one place. Now you may push it out from that one place to other places. An example for that would be Active Directory. So how many of you, you click the raise your hand icon, raise your hands, show me by your hands. How many of you folks use Outlook in your work environment? Or maybe you know you already use Active Directory. So Michelle is an Outlook person. Anybody else out there an Outlook person? Now I tell you what, you folks stay engaged and do the raise your hand thing and put stuff in the questions and I'll pick somebody and give them an Amazon gift card. How's that? That's one of my favorite management sayings, you get what you incent. So right now, Michelle, you're in the lead. You've been super responsive. I wish you had a smile face icon so I could see how that makes you feel. So Outlook, right? Your employee network is probably driven if you're on a Microsoft platform by Active Directory. That's where it keeps your email address. And if you click on the address book in Outlook, you'll see it also knows your department, your phone number, who you report to, all that sort of stuff. Well, that's a pain to keep all that employee data in Active Directory in sync with what, wherever you store your HR information. So if you do it in a spreadsheet, if you change someone's department or division or location or phone number, or they get married and their last name changes, you have to go tell IT to change it in Active Directory. Well, if we have everything in one place and we're using an HRMS, there's probably a way you could push that information from HRMS over to Active Directory. So you keep HRMS, the single source of truth, and you just share it with other applications as needed. So the top reason for having an HR system is to improve your HR data management. Now this next reason really comes down to risk mitigation. It's staying compliant with labor rules and regulations. An employer has to follow employment laws, including applicable federal, state, and local regulations. And you can be subject to an audit from any one of the enforcing agencies, and the result of that audit could levy fines and penalties for noncompliance. And it's not an excuse to say, hey, I, I didn't know we were supposed to do that. And in some cases, it can even lead to lawsuits, and those settlements can bankrupt an organization. Now, what's important to your organization depends on how many people are in the organization. So that's my next quick question for you is how many people are in your organization? Do you have just one to 14 employees, or 15 to 19, 20 to 49, 50 to 99, or 100 or more? Now, this should be a poll question everybody can answer, because even if you aren't in charge of HR, you probably have a rough idea of how many folks are in your organization. So about half of you have let me know. Just a couple more left. 
I'm going to close out this poll in five, four, three, two, one. So let's just see where we are today. It looks like about half of you have 100 or more employees, a quarter are in that 50 to 99 range, and 25 or another quarter are in the 20 to 49 percent range. Where that's important is because it really impacts what laws you have to follow. Now this is one of my favorite slides. I'm going to warn folks, I'm not an attorney, so I have to put that little caveat up there that this is not exhaustive and it certainly doesn't include your state or local laws. But what I've done here is gone through and listed all the federal laws or requirements, I should say, that are required based on an organization's size. And the way you read this table is you start from the left and work your way over to the right. Everyone, no matter how many people you have, have to follow all the rules that are in that all employers column. Then if you have 15 or more, you have to do everything in the first column, plus you have to add the five, uh, one, two, three, four <laughs> that are in that 15 or more column. If you hit 20 or more folks, you have to do all the ones in the all employers plus the 15 column, plus add the two. You get up to 50, you're gonna add FEMLA and ACA. And once you hit 100, you have to start doing your annual EEO1 reporting and the Worker Adjustment and Retraining Notification Act. So let me just give you a sense of what some of these are like. And you're probably familiar with some of them, right? Because hopefully you're doing these today. Although I have to be honest, there are times I've shared this kind of chart with folks and I've had organizations say, oh, I've never even heard of that. We're supposed to do that? It's like, oh yeah, 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 right? So the first one, FLSA, that's all about federal minimum wage, overtime and record keeping and child labor laws. So this tells you some of the records you're allowed to keep and how long you're allowed to keep them for. That's called retention. We have the Immigration Reform and Control Act. That's the I-9 basically. Be sure that you're verifying that the folks who work for you are allowed to work here in the United States. And even that I-9 form, has some really particular rules about it. For example, there's blanks, like let's say middle name, and the person doesn't have one. You know, you can't leave that field blank on the form. You have to put capital N slash capital A. If you're audited and you have fields like that that are blank, that by law require N slash A, that's gonna be dinged against you and that's a penalty. The Equal Pay Act, that just basically says we have to have equal compensation for men and women who perform identical or substantially equal work. The Credit Consumer Credit Protection Act protects employees from being discharged because of a single wage garnishment against them. And it limits the amount that can be garnished from their paychecks in any given work week. So if you're in an industry or your organization has a large number of garnishments, especially if the garnishments are across multiple jurisdictions, it can be a little bit complicated to sort of remember, okay, what are the caps? What are the prioritization of garnishments? What's the most I can take out? Well, if you're using the right software, in this case, to help drive payroll, it knows all about garnishments. It stays up with, to date with all the laws. You don't have to worry about it. We have ERISA, that's the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. That's all about private sector employees with group health and welfare plans. Of course, you have FICA. This authorizes you to withhold Social Security and Medicare taxes, OSHA requirements. OSHA is something you don't even want to mess with. I hate to tell you, if you're going to have an OSHA audit, that's when you just think, oh, please, please let this go well. Let's hope I didn't you know, piss anybody off in a past life. So OSHA is all about occupational safety and health. Fair Credit Reporting Act, that regulates how you can obtain and use consumer reports, including your background checks. HIPAA, employers that offer benefit plans have to adhere to HIPAA's privacy and anti-discrimination and security rules. The National Labor Relations Act, that's about creating unions. And then we just go from there, right? The Americans with Disabilities Act, Title VII, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. I think that's a real interesting one that a lot of folks have never even heard of, that employers can't discriminate against job applicants and employees based on their genetic information, uh, age discrimination all the way to the right. So this might be maybe the most valuable slide in this whole deck is to take this Go make sure that you're adhering to all of these regulations, right, that go behind these different acts. 
my third rule or reason that HR software is important is it can help automate routine tasks and that will just help you save time and reduce errors. When we automate a task that's time consuming and redundant, things like entering and copying data on spreadsheets, reconciling payroll, you know, handling taxes, uh, doing scheduling, approving time off requests. If we can automate any of those things, it streamlines the workflow. It also makes sure that all your processes are consistent and it's gonna reduce the likelihood that you make mistakes. Brian Kropp is the group vice president of Gartner and I'm sure you've heard of Gartner Research. I like this quote from him, traditional HR methods are failing. In a survey they did, two thirds of business leaders told us that if their company didn't digitalize more by 2020, it would no longer be competitive. In HR, digitalization is changing everything from core functions like the way we hire and develop talent for introducing whole new burdens, such as how do we raise performance? How do we, how do we get people to do a better job? I just look at my sort of uh, path in life. I turned 57 in June, and I remember when I graduated college in 86, filling out tons of paper applications and sending out letters and waiting to get responses back. And you know, I think I must have applied to 50, 60 places when I graduated. Now people expect, especially depending on the type of job you're looking at, to be able to apply online. And you expect to be able to do all this electronically. I know that in our own environment, right, in our company, which is software based, people would flip out if we told them to print out a PDF and fill it out and then hand it in. Or, you know, even if you say, okay, fill it out online and email it to us, they expect to just do it on a web form. I mean, I know through the pandemic, I shopped online, tracked packages, uh, even sent thank you notes, <laughs> all without ever talking to a person. And I was great with that. HR software can really help automate tasks that we do all the time, week after week, month after month, saving time and reducing errors. Now those first three reasons are sort of very, very big picture, but let's go down and start to look at some of the details right in the process. Mark Benioff is the founder and chairman and CEO of Salesforce. He says acquiring the right talent is the most important key to growth. Hiring was and still is the most important thing we do. And HR software can help save you a ton of money and time when it comes to hiring the right talent. If you can hire the right person from the get-go, you're gonna spend less time on training and supervision. They're gonna come up to speed quicker. They're gonna be more productive quicker. You can increase the efficiency of the whole recruiting process. You can reach multiple job boards. So you only have to create that job posting once and the right software can send it to multiple places and get it posted. It'll track and manage your candidates. It'll let you leverage social media networking. So that's when you can post a job and it comes with all the links. Um, as Jolene mentioned, right? Share it on Twitter, share it on LinkedIn, share it on Facebook. Some applicant tracking systems will even help you sift through and sort applications. It'll score them, it'll look for keywords. Uh, if they have spelling mistakes, it'll actually lower their score. Whatever you set up, whatever's right for you. The whole goal here is to attract the right talent for the right position at the right time. I think the other thing that we're trying to do in this space is maintain a database of who applied for these jobs in the past. Because then you have a talent pool so that when a new job pops up, besides the posting and everything you're doing in one place, you can then send email to that, that list you've maintained, that pool, and say, hey, here's a, here's a new job, and if, you not, if you're not interested, maybe you could share it with someone who is, right? So that's all about hiring the right talent, and HR software can help you do that. Now, if you don't hire a ton of folks, you might say, hey, well, I'm not really, this isn't important to me. Again, that's when choosing perhaps a best of breed solution where you can pick and choose where you have to invest money to get that functionality uh, would make more sense for you, right? If it all comes bundled together, you're basically paying for everything, even there's parts you don't care about. Number five on the list is onboarding. This is a critical process and it affects everything from an employee's performance to even the customer experience. 
I like this quote from Joseph Pettiford. He's the Chief Human Resources Officer at Jefferson County Schools in West Virginia. Onboarding shouldn't be painful. We want to create a situation where people say, wow, I can't believe how easy that was. Once people experience that, they'll share the experience with others, which will attract strong candidates to our district. So typically, when you look, say, historically at onboarding, you're all excited about your first day at work. Think about your organization, right? Somebody's excited, hey, I'm starting today. Yahoo, this is going to be great. And the first thing they do is they get marched down to HR where they go through a ton of forms and have to sit and fill things out. They probably aren't at their desk. They may not even know their own phone number. Right, that's typically how it was done. Well, now we can use an online portal to deliver those new hire documents like federal and state tax forms, policies that you have to acknowledge, even benefits enrollment. We can even onboard folks before their first day on the job. And that's pretty cool because then you can email someone and say, hey, Sally, we know you don't start till September 1st, but here's a link to our portal. You can get started on all your onboarding stuff while you're at home. And you know, if you show up on September 1st and you have 50% of it done, we're gonna give you a $100 gift card. Remember that saying I used, you get what you incent. You don't want them to spend their first half day at work going through all this paperwork. Let them do it at home. And in many cases, data they need will be available to them at home, right? When you go to fill out a form and you have either contact information for emergency contacts or relatives, or you need to discuss it with your you know, spouse, hey, do it from home. We can also, as part of the onboarding ex experience, automate some routine tasks. So it overlaps with one of our earlier reasons, but the work opportunity credit, the WOTC application, um, if your organization isn't taking advantage of WOTC right now, you should definitely check that out because it can be bringing money back into the organization based on your hiring policies. And of course, if we do all this electronically, we can simplify tracking who's done what and are they compliant. So again, I, I am used to seeing these paper checklists where HR folks are tracking okay, we did a new handbook or you know, new employee, did we get their I-9 check? Did we get their handbook signature check? Did they sign the uh, you know, security agreement check? Why are we doing that and checking all that by hand? If we have it electronically, it's easier to track, it's easier to report on. And as we'll talk about later on, you could even send email reminders. Because remember with that I-9, as an example, we have to get that done within three business days. Now, I-9 is one where you do have to see them face-to-face -face and look at some paper documents. Uh, remember the documents from lists A, B, and C that are on the I-9? But at least electronically, we can track, have we done that? And it'll take care of the retention policies because you can't keep those I-9 forms forever and ever. So we want to be sure we automatically get rid of those because we don't want to get dinged if there's an audit. Reason number six, accurately track employee time. Now, this is a foundational process for every business because if you accurately track time, you're going to avoid payroll errors. And I read a study somewhere that if someone experiences an error in their paycheck, there is a 50% chance they will leave the organization within one year. Don't mess with people's payroll. People don't like it when you make mistakes. The other thing, if we accurately track employee time, is we can reduce labor expenses, right? The right systems can really kind of prevent buddy punching, missed punches, things like that. You get improved oversight of mobile and off-site employees. And I think the right time tracking and, and attendance tracking software really can increase trust between employees and management because they know, hey, I'm I'm actually recording what really happened and I'm getting compensated for what really happened. It can also speed up the whole time card approval process and keep track of time off requests. And this is important because when someone goes to ask for time off, if they say, you know, if you have to say, look, I'm sorry, you don't have any more, you've hit the limit, then you get into that hole. But I only thought I took four days, but you think I took six days. Well, when did I take six days instead of four days? And you've got to do that reconciliation. The right software keeps track of it, makes it really easy for someone to know exactly what was recorded. 
And of course, it's going to save time when it comes down to scheduling, because a lot of these applications have functionality and then that makes it really easy to repeat schedules, copy schedules, kind of warn you if schedules are out of whack. Now, a lot of this ties in well with my seventh reason, empowering employees through self-service. I mentioned it earlier when I said during the pandemic, I was shopping on Amazon and tracking my packages and sending thank you notes and everything without talking to anybody. People have come to expect that. Earlier on the call, I was talking with Jolene about one of my team members, Jaden, who I think just turned 22 in the fall. And we were talking about movies and stuff and being able to go out to movies again at some point. And he said, you know, I book my movie seats. I buy the tickets over my phone. And if I can't do that, I don't go to that theater. Expectations about what you can do on your own, online, and even on what device have changed dramatically in the last 10 years. This little study, I put that ring chart up there, basically says that 87% of organizations agree that self-service portals are the most efficient way to provide employees with payroll and HR information. It really improves their whole experience, right? They can just on demand go see what whatever they want to see, right? How many days do I have left? How many days have I taken? When did I take them? This saves HR time because it can be overwhelming to retrieve data and answer employee questions. SHRM, the Society for Human Resource Management, says that an organization should have about one HR person for every 100 employees. While that's a great benchmark, there are times I, I, I don't even see people close to it. I see organizations with 1,000, 2,000 employees that have two HR people. And they're just inundated with questions from employees and managers. Self-service would help alleviate that burden. And it saves managers time too, because they can get data, they can see the data that they need in order to make better decisions on you know, scheduling, on assignments, on past performance, on whether or not somebody should be on a performance improvement plan, on compensation and comparing compensation across the people that report to them. So self-service is all about empowering people to let them see data and use it effectively, and in some cases, change the data, right, without filling out a paper form. Update my address, update my phone number, uh, update my skill set, things like that. My eighth reason is all about payroll and the interface to payroll. There's an obvious connection between HR and payroll. HR captures employee data that impacts payroll, right? Basic demographic information. Uh, what Benefits did employees select? And what's their contribution compared to the employer, employer's contribution? What's their rate of pay? Uh, do they want to set up direct deposit? Have they, you know, what is their information from their W-4? And then you have ACA compliance through all this. Now, most payroll software will handle the minimums of this, whatever is barely required to do payroll. So payroll software may have, of course, demographic information and say rate of pay. But in my book, that really belongs in the HR system and then should be shared over to the payroll system. Because when it's in the HR system, now it's part of the whole picture I have of employee. And when I start doing some critical thinking, some analytics, people analytics, to kind of say, okay, do we have any pay disparities within a department or a division or by gender? Um, I can start to look at that when I have all that information integrated with the other demographics that would be appropriate in the HR system. So I like having some of this core data in HR, it's employee specific, and then make sure that it talks to the payroll system. So as an example, in the Sage ecosphere, Sage HRMS has beautiful connectors to lots and lots of payroll systems, but especially Sage 100 and Sage 300. Sharing data between HR and payroll just optimizes processes and it provides just a better experience. Because remember, when we go back to that self-service portal, not only can I see what my current salary is, even my historical compensation, but I can get access to all my pay stubs, even get my W-2 at the end of the year right out of that portal. The right HR software can also help improve performance. Our whole goal here is to increase the likelihood that each employee delivers on what your expectations are for them. You're trying to create a process that sets clear expectations, provides ongoing coaching, 
and documents the results. And when you have that kind of clear, clear process, you can reduce biases and appraisals and help make the performance appraisal process more objective and more valuable. And in many organizations, we link performance information to other HR data, like compensation. So some of you probably follow what I would consider a traditional performance approach. Maybe it's done annually. There's a time where you set goals for a 12-month period. Six months into it, you reevaluate and those goals. And then at the end of the year, you evaluate them again and do a write-up. Most organizations now are moving to a more continuous or approach, an agile approach, where you set goals, and the goals are typically very measurable. Remember that acronym, acronym SMART goals, specific, measurable, is the M. So maybe it's metric-based goals. The salesperson has to hit this quota. We want HR to lower the number of incident, incidents of OSHA incidents by 10%. A call center. Your calls should be between three to five minutes. 90% of all your calls are between three to five minutes. So very number driven, metric driven. Sometimes it's checklists. I need you to accomplish this goal and in order to do it you need to do these seven things. Check, 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 check. When employees feel really clear about what, they're ex what you expect of them, they know how they're doing because they can always get sort of real-time results against what those goals are. They're getting coaching sessions, and remember coaching is different than feedback. Um, so we'll, SWK will keep you posted. We do a whole webinar just on how to be an effective coach. When you're in that kind of environment, employees tend to be more engaged. Again, different than job satisfaction. Engaged is when you go that extra mile. This study by Cone Communications showed that organizations with highly engaged employees had an average three-year revenue growth more than two times greater than those whose employees showed average engagement. So if we can get folks engaged, it's gonna increase the bottom line. And I know it's gonna give you a better customer experience for the folks that those employees have to deal with. And remember, by customer, it doesn't have to be an external party that pays you money. In some cases, a customer is an internal person who consumes the services that the other employee provides. I always tell my HR folks, you're all CSRs, you're all customer service, rep, service reps. Employees, managers, executives, they are all your customers. You are in a service position. So bottom line is when folks are engaged, they deliver better service and it trickles all the way down to a bigger bottom line. I want you to keep this kind of number in mind when we talk about how to write up a business case. Our 10th reason is it helps retain employees. And it is very expensive to bring on a new employee. When you lose someone, bringing on someone new costs more than just their salary, right? There's a whole recruiting cost, training cost, bringing them up to speed. Richard Branson, I think, has the best quote I've ever seen for this. Train people well enough so they can leave treat them well enough so they don't want to. How cool is that? You know, I work with a lot of accounting firms and I've had accounting firms in the past tell me, oh, we don't, we don't, we don't want an, our employee, you know, a list of employees or, or folks on our website because our competitors will poach them. And I think they've missed the mark because your employees, they're gonna be out on LinkedIn or wherever they want. Don't worry so much about shielding your employees from going to the competition. Instead, work hard to be the employer of choice. A lot of this we know comes from having the right training and development systems in place. People want to stay at an organization that they know values them and is helping them in their career journey. HR software can help automatically assign certifications and trainings based on an employee's role. You can track training requirements and enrollments and status and more. Um, it can automatically notify you if there's an expiration date of a certification or a licensure. Um, it, it really shows employees that you've sat down with them, you've created sort of a career roadmap that includes some training, and it's documented in this system that's even gonna track their progress. It also can help eliminate some non-compliance fines when you're in a situation where people have to have certain training, licensures, certifications, then the right talent management system 
HR system that really focuses on training and development is going to help you stay compliant by letting you know, woohoo, this is going to expire in three months. You know, be sure that you get it renewed. As I mentioned, when you're training, when you're investing in training for folks, when you're investing in them that they know they have a development plan, job satisfaction goes up, morale goes up, motivation goes up, you get more efficient, right? And you become engaged. And we know that hits the bottom line. Now I mentioned, yoo-hoo, yoo-hoo, certification is going to expire in three months. Well, that's my 11th reason, alerts and notifications. You never want to be blindsided by HR data. There's a whole class of software applications out there called business activity monitoring or BAM applications. And these things let you respond to critical time sensitive data. They're super powerful when we aim them at that single source of truth, that HR database because it can look for certain conditions and then trigger an automated response. That response could be email, notification, it could be an SMS text message, it can even automatically deliver reports um, as an example. Sometimes it's data sensitive conditions like a new hire. So when you hire somebody, you've got to let different departments know and security to get a badge and parking to get them a parking sticker and IT to set up their workstation. And are you doing all that by hand? Instead, the minute you mark somebody as a new hire, the right BAM application, yoo-hoo, yoo-hoo, we're hiring somebody, they need a workstation, yoo-hoo, and you only send those folks the information they need in order to fulfill that task. Maybe it's when pay rates change, right? You're looking at data changes. So if someone gets a raise, you wanna let someone know, and maybe somebody gets a raise over a certain percentage, there's sort of watchdogs in your organization that wanna know that. Maybe you're monitoring different thresholds like excessive absenteeism because you need to bring it to someone's attention. Hey, we might have a problem here. Maybe it's an exception-based alert. Someone hasn't finished training. Uh, someone failed a drug test. We can also set up alerts for things that didn't happen. So someone didn't renew their visa or they didn't fulfill some of those check marks in our performance uh, application where we're doing goal setting. It can find spots where you have data integrity problems. You can look for trends, right? And trends and patterns, that's how we can continually improve. That's sort of a whole new level of analytics when we're starting to look, it's actually called prescriptive uh, analytics, where we're looking for trends to try to fix things, head things off early in the process. You might also look for inconsistent data, like a scheduling conflict, right? Or labor allocations that are off. So an HRMS can have alerts and notifications. And my last reason here out of the 12 is that you can make better decisions. You can use people analytics based on real-time metrics to allow your decision makers to spot trends and manage the workforce more effectively. You can generate reports to help identify problems, look for those patterns I talked about and trends, when you're manually extracting data, you might miss things, right? Because you're only pulling out data that you need to get a certain report done. If this data is all sitting there and you've got an analytics tool aimed at it and it's got some spectacular dashboard that makes it easy for you to say, well, what, what if, let me slice this. Let me look at men versus women. Let me look at folks who are this age and younger compared to that age and older. Let me look by manager and something can jump out at you where you say, whoa, look, whoa, 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 look at this manager. All his people are paid less than everyone else. Or, oh, look at this manager. Their performance review scores for their team are consistently lower than the average for everybody else. We might have a problem. I might need an intervention, right? The right tool will let you ask those sort of what if questions and explore the data that you have in order to make a difference. Now, when we're talking about doing this thing, that we're talking about strategic HR. Well, you don't have time to do strategic HR if you're still messing with, I gotta type in this new hire form because they filled out a paper application. And then I got a W4 change, I gotta go type all that in. And then I've got to build a report for Frank because every Wednesday, Frank gets a report from the HR system. So that's where we want to go through some of these 12 reasons is because automating saves time, saves money, but it frees up time for me to play a more strategic role. The right analytics tool is gonna have hundreds, 
right? Sage HRMS, I think, has 260 built-in reports. So the odds are, whatever you're looking for, there's already a, a report there or pretty close that you could just fiddle with easily in a point-and-click environment. Dashboards let you really monitor what's important. And I give you 14 examples there of HR metrics that you might want to be looking at, right? And again, it doesn't really matter how you're measuring it exactly. There's a million ways to manage turnover. As long as you measure it the same way, calculate it the same way every time, and what you're really looking for is a trend. So you're going to want to do this, you know, every so often, some sort of periodicity, and then look for the trend. Now, I've given you 12 reasons why an investment in HR software makes sense. Well, how do we convince somebody we ought to make that investment? Well, that's really all about the business case. Did you know you can go into Google and type define colon and anything and it'll give you a definition? Now, I think, how about show of hands, how many of you on today's webinar, raise your hand icon, are in the finance, accounting, CPA, number kind of space? Anybody up, oh, Michelle, Lisa? So I have a couple. So some of you, you're not in HR and you're not in accounting. Maybe you're in operations. I don't know where you are. So now I'm going to talk about a financial calculation here, return on investment with finance people on the phone. So uh, you'll have to forgive me, right? We're going to do an amateur approach here. But I love this definition of business case, a structured proposal for business improvement that functions as a decision package for organizational decision makers. A business case includes an analysis of business process performance, associated needs or problems, proposed alternative solutions, assumption constraints, and a cost-benefit analysis. I've underlined the key parts here. It's structured. There is a certain order that you put things in when you're writing a business case. And it's a decision package for decision makers. You know what that means? It's a sales pitch. A business case is a marketing sales document. You're trying to convince someone to approve the idea that you've come up with. As part of that sales process, you're going to talk about needs and problems. You're going to have some alternatives, assumptions, constraints, and then show the what's in it for us. Why, why is there a benefit to this? So I want to share with you an example. Here is a business case. This is a template from the University of Auckland, New Zealand. And I have this as a Word doc. If you're interested in getting this template, uh, reach out to SWK and they can connect you up with it. I like it because they've highlighted in that green, you know, mostly the things you have to change. But let's look at the table of contents. It starts with an executive summary. And you begin with what's the situation or problem that we're trying to solve. And this second line item is critical. Opportunity. That means why now? And in fact, in my role, if you called me and said, hey, Joe, we, we want a new HR mask. We need an HR mask. Can you help me? Any salesperson that has any skills at all, they're going to come to this question. Why now? What's changed? You haven't had one for 10 years. You haven't had one for five years, forever. Why now? And if you say, well, because I'm a new employee and I hate the thing we have, so I figured I'd just look it up and try to change it, then no. That's not a good use of my time. It has to be, well, we have this new problem we've just figured out. We now have budget. We have a new HR person. We have, uh, we're our recruiting. We're growing. It's climb going through the roof. There has to be a reason that now is the right time. Then you're going to show your recommendation. What are the benefits of your recommendation? And how does it align to your organizational strategies? I even encourage you to go find your organization's mission, vision statement, right? and use some of the words that are in that because the odds are executives helped write that mission vision and you're going to use their words and when they read their own words in the business case they're going to be like oh that sounds really good i like that whoever wrote that knows their stuff right align it to what your organization's trying to achieve you're going to talk about the cost the background and then the options there's always at least two options in a business case what you want them to do and do nothing. There's always two options in a business case. Then you can get into objectives and scope and what's included and constraints and all the way down to how it fits your enterprise architecture costs, right? That's all part of a business case. 
and the benefits, that's going to be the return on investment. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And you need a sign off sheet. Now, how many of you have ever asked someone to approve something? You fired off an email. It doesn't really have this structure. And then you never hear back. And you're like, I, I don't know if we're supposed to do it or not. I never heard back. Did you make it real clear? Please sign here by this date so that I have a clear answer, right? You need some kind of a sign off sheet. Now, when you look at this, you're like, oh my God, Joe, this is 300 pages. It can be as short as an email. And one of my new hires once was an IT person and they wanted to replace our color printer, use this wax, that's how old it was, with a new color laser printer and came to my office and said, hey, Joe, can I go out and buy us a new printer? Micro Center has them on sale. And I was like, no, write a business case. Here's an outline, go figure it out. And of course they complained to high heaven. But a couple hours later, I got an email that said, Joe, we have a color printer that's so old, it's it wax is expensive, we can't get it, I don't know how to fix it. That's the situation or problem. The printers are currently on sale at Micro Center for the next two weeks, that's the opportunity. I recommend an HP blah, 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 because blah, 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 you want your printouts for customer proposals to look amazing, and this will help us do that. That's the alignment of strategies. We could do nothing, and if this printer breaks, I don't know how soon I could replace it. The ink costs this much, or we could go with my option A. And he went right down this list in about three paragraphs or two paragraphs in an email, and I approved it because it answered all my questions and it was in a structure that I could figure out. So let me give you a couple tips here for return on investment. Financial. There's lots of ways to calculate return on investment. I've given you a couple definitions here. I like payback period. Payback period just says, if we've got a solution today that costs us 500 bucks a month, and I wanna replace it with something that costs 11,000 bucks for the year, well, the payback period is 11,000 divided by 500, 22 months. In 22 months, we will have paid for this thing because we're not paying that $500 a month anymore. But let me give you a hard example, an HR system with self-service. On the left, these folks already have an HR system, but there's no employee self-service. They have 150 employees. So I made some assumptions here. 150 folks, their average comp is 40K, that's $19 an hour. Seven managers, it's really flat organization, right? Each manager has about 20 reports. They make about 50K, that's 24 bucks an hour. You have two HR folks, that's even more than Sherm says, right? They make about 16 bucks an hour. Employees spend two hours a year with HR related questions. How many vacation days do I have left? How much are my benefits? I, I, I wonder who are my dependents? Can I change my address? I think two hours is pretty reasonable. Maybe that's even getting their pay stubs. Managers, I put spend 50 hours a year, about an hour a week. And HR spends 250 hours a year, 2,000 hours in a year. This is way low because some HR folks say they spend 40% of their time answering employee questions. But if you do the math, this basically works out to about $1,800 a month in staff costs. Now, these numbers, are for a perpetual license system. They're a little bit old. I just want you to get the theory here. Now we wanna add ESS. The product, perpetual license, you buy the software, 6,300 bucks, gotta pay for support. That's typically about, what, 20% of the product. So that's 1,300 bucks. We're gonna get you trained and install it. Typically, that's at least the cost of the system, so I made that up, 7,500 bucks. And we're gonna put it on a screaming server. Boy, this thing could play all sorts of games for 3,500 bucks. Your first year cost just in physical expenses is 18K. Now, I can't assume we're not gonna spend any time, right? So I said, we're gonna save 90% of our time. So we're gonna still spend 10%. So where we were spending $5,700, employees were asking questions, now it's only 577 bucks. Same with managers in HR. So our people costs 2,200 bucks. Our first year cost 20K. So payback, 20K divided by 1,800. This thing will pay for itself in 11 months. And the cool thing is in the second year, we start saving money, right? 
we start saving money because we don't have all those first year costs. Now, if we do a subscription model, it's going to be a little bit different. This is a financial ROI. But any time you change systems, there's three potential ROIs, financial, cultural, and procedural. So just think about this self-service example. What's it going to do to our culture when employees can get on the web and look up whatever they need 24-7? What's it going to do for procedure when we don't have to fill out paper forms and go type them in and track where they are and file them somewhere? So while I focused on financial ROI here, if I were writing a business case for self-service, I would talk about three types of return on investment. The financial one, and the numbers folks are going to love that, but the cultural one and the procedural one. And the odds are you could take cultural and procedural, boil it down to financial. If it's cultural, people like us, they're more engaged, they stay, that saves us hiring new folks. And procedural saves us time and reduces error, which is going to also save money. You can always boil everything down to money. But I think it's special to keep it as separate items, cultural, procedural, and financial. Of course, any time you introduce a new system, change can be rough. Me, as an example, I don't like change. So think about these tips. Gain executive sponsorship and commitment early. The only way you're going to replace any software, not just HR software, is if you have executive sponsorship early. Never go for buy-in. Buy-in doesn't work. Define and commit to a timeline. I still have a Samsung Galaxy Note 5. My phone is 15 versions behind because every time I spend time researching what phone I should buy, by the time I'm done researching, there's a whole new phone because I can't commit to a timeline. Know your budget. Stay focused. Stay organized. Be sensitive to risk factors, right? There are going to be folks, if you're going to bring in an HR system and it's going to interface with payroll, payroll folks might get a little nervous, so be sensitive to that. Overall, just be sensitive to classic change management issues. Now, hopefully, you've gotten some value out of the 12 reasons why it's worth investing in HR software, and you have an idea of how you could pitch this idea in a business case. So I'd like to invite you to three events we have coming up. You probably don't want to go to all three. You probably want to pick one. So let me put up a little poll here. You can let us know if you'd like to register for any of these. They're listed on the SWK website. You could register yourself. But if you go ahead and let us know what you're interested in, we'll do the heavy lifting for you. We'll enter your registration. You'll get an email from GoTo with a link that's unique to you. That's what you're going to use, right? So this poll is coming out now. You should see it any sec. Would you like us to register you for any of these events? So coming up on 921, I have an overview of Sage HRMS. That's sort of just a generic overview of an HR software system that does everything that we've talked about here. It's a best of breed solution. On October the 5th, I'm gonna focus on Sage HRMS for Sage 100 Cloud. So we'll specifically talk about everything that's in the generic one, but then I'm really gonna zoom in on how it integrates with Sage 100. And then on November the 2nd, we're going to do the same thing, but how it integrates with 300 Cloud. And of course, if you just can't wait and you want to talk about HR software right away, just check that box. So you probably wouldn't want to come to all three of these because there's a huge overlap. So the first one is just sort of all of Sage HRMS kind of generic. The second and third ones, the 101 and the 300 one, it's really that same generic webinar, but I'm going to be very specific about the integration between those two different ERP systems. And of course, if you don't want to wait till September or October or November, you can let me know. So about half of you have let me know. I'm going to give you just a few more seconds to see if anybody would like to let us do the heavy lifting and we will register for you register you for whatever ones you pick here. So I'm going to close out this poll in five, four, three, two, one. Again, today's webinar is part of our thought leadership series and it is pre-qualified for both SHRM and HRCI certification credits. If you're a CPA, you can find out through your local CPA organization if you can use today's seminar towards your CPA uh, renewals. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Jolene. Thank you, Joe. We'll now open it up for questions. If you have any questions, please enter them into the question section of GoToWebinar. 
And just to remind everyone, we do have a subject matter expert here. This is a great opportunity to have your questions answered in real time. We'll give that just one minute in case any come in. And while we're waiting, Joe, I was wondering if you'd like to announce who's won the Amazon gift card for the webinar. I am going to give an Amazon gift card to Michelle because Michelle's raising her hand all the time and she was answering. So Michelle, congratulations. We will be sending you an Amazon gift card electronically through your email. Congratulations, Michelle. We'll be in touch shortly. And it doesn't look like we've had any questions that have come in. So thank you so much, Joe, for your informative presentation, for taking the time to be here today. And thank you everyone for attending our webinar. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, everybody.